Actually, we achieved something what's, what's known in the field as quantum supremacy. Uh, it is when you can take quantum computers and they can do something which classical computers cannot. Um, and, uh, and you know, I like the way you characterized it. It's as inspiring a milestone as the Deep Blue moment or AlphaGo uh, playing with Lace at all. To me, you know, nature at a fundamental level uh, works in a quantum way. You know, at a subatomic level, things can exist in many different states at the same time. Classical computers work in ones and zeros. So we know that's an imperfect way uh, to simulate nature. Nature works differently. So what's exciting about quantum computing and why we are so excited about the possibilities is it'll allow us to understand the world in a deeper way. We can simulate nature better. So that means simulating molecular structures. So maybe we can discover better drugs. Mm -hmm. Understanding climate in a deeper way so that we can predict weather patterns and tackle climate change. We can design better batteries. Nitrogen fixation, which is the process by which we make the world's fertilizers, accounts for 2% of carbon emissions. And the process hasn't changed in a long time because it's very complicated. Quantum computers one day allows us the hope that we can make that process more efficient. So it's very profound. We've all been dealing in technology with the end of Moore's law. Uh, you know, it's re really revolutionized the past 40 years, but it's leveled off. So when I look at the future and say, how do we drive improvements, quantum would be one of the tools in our arsenal uh, by which we can keep something like Moore's law continuing to evolve. So the potential is huge, and you know, we'll have challenges. You know, in a five to 10 year time frame, quantum computing will break encryption as we know it today. But you know, we, can, we can work around it. We need to do quantum encryption. Uh, so there are challenges, as always, with any evolving technology. But I think the combination of AI and quantum will help us tackle some of the biggest problems we see. And you add also, to a certain extent, genetics. I mean, I think uh, quantum computing and biology will, One of the uh, biggest will, will have a great potential. Yeah. Positive and negative one? Uh, the positive one, as you're saying rightly, is uh, you know, to simulate molecules, protein folding, etc. To It's very, very complex today. We cannot do it with classical computers. So with quantum computers, yeah. we can. Yeah. Uh, but we have to be clear-eyed about uh, you know, all these powerful technologies. And uh, you know, this is why you know, I think we need to be deliberate and regulate uh, uh, technologies like AI and as a society needs to need to engage on it. You know, I, I've said this before, I, AI is one of the most profound things we are working on humanity, uh, as humanity. It's more profound than fire or electricity or any of the other bigger things we have worked on. Uh, it has tremendous positive sides to it, but, you know, it has real negative consequences. You know, when you think about uh, technologies like facial recognition, it can be used to benefit. It can be used to find missing people, but it can be used for mass surveillance. And as, as democratic countries with a shared set of values, we need to you know, build on those values and make sure when we approach AI, we are doing it in a way that serves society. And that means making sure AI doesn't have bias, that we build and test it for safety. We make sure that there is human agency, that it's ultimately accountable to people. In about 18 months ago, we published a set of principles under which we would develop AI as Google. Mm -hmm. But it's been very encouraging to see the European Commission has identified AI and sustainability as their you know, top priorities. Mm -hmm. And it's in, US put out a set of principles last week. And be it the OECD or G20, they're talking about this, which I think is very, very encouraging. And I think we need a common framework by which we approach AI. Are you, are you satisfied with those frameworks you said, which have been developed until now? I mean, you refer to the OECD framework, G20 framework. It's an early start. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm very encouraged that they are, they have a lot of commonality and that's because they are rooted in common yeah. human values. So I think it's a great start, but we need to get more specific and, and evolve it significantly. Uh, I think the European Commission is working on yeah. uh, you know, a white paper yeah. around AI, and uh, I think that's an important first step, and we all need to engage. As a company, we are committed to engaging in the process, but it's going to need everyone from around the world. 
AI is no different from climate. You know, you can't get safety by just having one country or a set of countries uh, working on it. You know, you need a global framework uh, to arrive at a safer world there. But Sunda, you, you emphasize a global framework now. Um... You know, I think there is, uh, there is concern that we could, you know, uh, bifurcate here. Uh, but I think it's important not to do so. I'm optimistic because just like in climate, I think there's more alignment. You know, we have things like the Paris Agreement. The world comes together because everyone shares uh, the climate uh, in which the Earth, uh, you know, how it affects the Earth. And so I think that's true for AI. So down the line, I think there'll be, there'll be a common gravitational pull, uh, regardless of who you are, to try and converge. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to achieve peace and prosperity. So I think there'll be a, uh, there'll be a gravitational pull. No, we need it, and we actually it. the forum with its center for the fourth industrial revolution is trying uh, to, to bring the parties together. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe we'll talk about privacy. You know, uh, GDPR has been a great, uh, great uh, um, uh, template. Um, I think it gives a standardized privacy framework, uh, you know, and Often when we are in other countries and when we are, they are thinking about privacy regulation, you know, we point to GDPR as a template. I'm glad Europe took the lead on it. And I think that gives a good framework for all of us to work on. Um, for us, you know, privacy is at the heart of what we do. You know, users come to Google at very important moments, ask us questions. We deal with people's sensitive information in Gmail, Google Photos, and so on. And so we have to earn that trust. And, you know, today we do it by giving them control and transparency and choice around it. Mm -hmm. And over time, I think AI actually allows us to do this better. We can do more for our users. Most of the data today we deal with is to help users with their information needs. And we can do that with less data over time. Um, and it's counterintuitive. But last year, for example, if you use Google's keyboard, we actually now learn uh, what to suggest but we don't send the raw data back. We only compute our models, and the data stays on the phones. So over time, I think we can do more things on device. We can use AI to actually preserve privacy as we improve user experiences. And I do think it should be, it's important that products need to work for everyone. It's a foundational principle. So today, if you take a product like YouTube, we allow users to pay for it and get it in an ad-free basis, or you have an ad-supported product. It's what allows us to take information and provide many services to billions of people around the world. And you know, privacy cannot be a luxury good. We sure, need to so. make sure we develop services in a way that works for everyone, but puts them first and you know, is privacy enhancing. And, and that's the journey we are all on. But ultimately, it's up to users to choose. On your second question, I think with our scale, uh, rightfully comes scrutiny. You're right, we have bought startups, but you know, as a company, we invest every single year in hundreds of startups through our venture arms. We support entrepreneurs and incubators around the world. Uh, you know, through our Grow with Google program, we are trying to digitally skill millions of people. In Europe alone, we have skilled over 5 million Europeans. So with scale comes the chance to work on things, take a long-term view on important technologies like AI and quantum computing. And so you know, that it gives us a chance to do that. But ultimately, you know, we have to do it all in a way that works for society. That's the real test. And society has to judge whether what we are doing is beneficial. And you know, we want to engage constructively in the process and, 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 you know, and earn our right to do that. But we aren't, do, you know, we aren't building up scale for scale's sake. You know, we are trying to do important things for our users. We are in the World Economic Forum. We bring people together. That's what the internet is all about. You know, the value of internet comes in connecting the world. And to do that, you need a free, open internet to work. At the same time, and you know, I see it's not just in India, as Professor Schwab mentioned. You know, it's 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 a big. A uh, big topic in Europe and all other countries around the world. Politicians, rightfully, you know, they are charged with protecting their citizens, and and as part of that, you know, data sovereignty is an important topic as well. But it is inherently a balance, right? And I think you need to 
I think countries need to focus on the highest risk areas and maybe add production around it. But you want to uh, you know, help preserve a common internet. Even in India, for example, if you take a product like YouTube, many creators in India, more than 50% of their views come from outside of India. The internet is essentially an export product. You know, you can build a service, regardless of where you build it, you can reach people around the world. That's what's great about the digital economy. It's, uh, it creates new opportunities. And so that's the balance countries have to strike. But I think, you know, uh, you know, I think there are good regulations. GDPR is a good framework as we think about how you can protect privacy for, our, for, for your users, for your citizens. Doesn't always mean data has to be siloed in a particular way. And I think, I think we need to evolve those frameworks carefully. Uh, you know, one of our AI principles is that AI is ultimately accountable to humans, and, and to do that well, explainability is a big part of it. Now, you can imagine a self-driving car making a decision and us being able to explain. I think it's worth remembering humans can't always explain how we make our decisions. We mm -hmm. think we can, uh, and we say some things, but you know, that's not how it really happens. So I think it's worth remembering that. But we are building, it's one of our most active areas of research. For example, to counter AI bias, you know, last year we published research. So for example, if you have an image recognition algorithm and it predicts and says these are doctors, we can now say what are the variables you're using to predict that these images are doctors. It may say white coats, that makes sense. But sometimes the model can say male because it has seen only pictures of male doctors. And then you know it's not working well. That's an example of explainability which we do. And you know, we are working hard to drive that. But it is an area of research. But I think it's an important principle to do that before we use AI in high risk applications. And, uh, but it's exciting as well. AI actually gives us a chance to do some things where humans are actually biased and we reinforce our bias to understand that, counter it, and do it in a better way as well. So we need to invest to get there. Yeah. The good thing about the healthcare sector, uh, you know, is that there are already strong regulations in place. You know, as we think about regulating AI, I think it's important to leverage regulations where they exist. And healthcare has good privacy protecting regulations in place. As Google, we see a huge opportunity in healthcare. But when we work on healthcare, uh, when we work with hospitals, the data belongs to hospitals, right? And that's how we approach it. Uh, where we can, we encrypt the data, and the hospitals would have the key for it. But look at the potential here. When we look at an area like radiology, when we, people, you know, there are often times cancer gets missed, and, and the difference in outcomes is profound. When you take an area like lung cancer, and you show the pathology results to experts, very often, if you show it to 10 experts, five people agree one way, five people agree the other way. We know we can use AI to make it better. And so I think it's important we do that. But I think these are areas in which you have to do it with privacy in mind. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged that there is strong privacy protecting regulation already in place, which gives us a framework to do it well. But I think healthcare offers the biggest potential, I think, over the next five to 10 years to really improve outcomes. And so we are committed to doing that.